<laughs> he got me good on that one. Pastor Matthew's a hugger, and so I was half expecting to hug him on the way up, and then uh, then he salutes. It's just that got me good. <laughs> Man, isn't God good to us? So, so amazing and powerful. And uh, you know, I thought about as I was getting ready this morning, and um, I guess I'll start off with with my joke first, and then I'll and then I'll go into the seriousness of it, but. I was getting ready this morning, and I did the whole, like, I went up to my wife. Usually, I don't. I will tell you, um, I always get, I always, a- I always am asked if my wife dresses me, and that's nothing against maybe our other pastoral staff that dresses, their spouse dresses them, um, but I always get asked if my wife dresses me, and, and 99% of the time, I dress myself, um, so I, I at least have some sense of style, a little bit. Uh, um, I hope so, at least, uh, but this morning... Uh, you know, I, I was getting dressed and my wife was like, just to play a joke, you should wear a suit onto the platform. And I was like, I, I don't, ah, uh, no. <laughs> I was so uncomfortable on the night of ordination wearing that suit. I could not wait to get home and take it off. Um, but it was just so awesome. And, 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 you know, it's just, it's amazing to see as God starts to work in our lives of, of where he leads us to and where he takes us to. Um, you know, I started to think about just as, as uh, the week kind of went on, and I'm just, can I, I, I'm always vulnerable with you guys, and so I'm just going to be a little bit vulnerable with you that this week got a little stressful for me. Um, I, I got a little stressed out over some of the things that went on this week, and, and uh, you know, it, it, it's just life, as life happens, and, and, and life throws curveballs at us, and it, and it throws, throws all these different things at us, and yet what, what really comes down to is where is our hope and trust and faith really relying in? And I thought about this, that this week, and as I was, you know, studying for my notes and putting everything together, and uh, we've got four beautiful children, but uh, I, was, I was with my four beautiful children by myself last night for a little while, and uh, that and trying to study sometimes just doesn't work out the best, and um, I ended up breaking up more fights than I could ever imagine uh, on the night, but I, you know, as it, as it really comes down to it, but Am I, am I focusing in on the task or am I focusing in on God? And I, I don't know really where, where, where you're coming from this week. And I'm, I'm sure just as much as maybe my week was stressful with different tasks because I was getting here and getting there and driving different places and, you know, time frames of things. And, and it's just like, it's kind of one of those things that it can be the calm for a quick second and then all of a sudden the storm hits. And it starts to kind of get at us at times. And I feel like, but in those moments of the storm and the moments of the trial and the moments of the craziness, so to say, and when we don't know which way is up, I believe it's really a a strong tactic of the enemy because if he can get us confused, then he can get us to stop looking up. If he can get us to start focusing in on what's really in front of me versus who's really inside of me, uh, who's, who's really leading me, who's really guiding me, who's really got my back, if he can get us focused on everything else, it's, it's when he begins to, to get us. Because then it's like our strength. We notice that we're maybe more tired than we are the night. We're, we notice that we're more irritable. We notice that we're a little bit more short with our, with our spouses or we're a little bit more short with our, with our kids. And, we're, and, and all these things are coming at us. And yet the whole entire time, I just feel like what God is saying is, I want to be the God of your peace. And, and, and you know, if, if we notice that in, in today's society, that some of the greatest things, it's like if they can be the loudest voice yelling at you, it can get you confused and, and kind of uh, trying to figure out really what, what's being said. If they, can, if they can be the loudest voice at you and scream at you, and, and, and if the enemy can be able to say all these different things, but yet if we can just silence, sit in silence for a moment to hear his voice. I loved when Pastor Christy was leading us in worship this morning and, and, and she said, you know, it's, it's really, it's about him. It's the blood that says the true word. And sometimes we forget that. Sometimes we, we as, as children of God, we, we begin to, um, okay, let's just, let's say it for real, right? Um, you know, when I was with my kids last night, one of the things I noticed is that um, they're all at different stages. I've got an 11-year-old, an 8 six and a, and a two 
And um, my, two, my two-year-old's actually in here with my wife today, so um, I'll be careful what I say about her. And so, um, but each one of them at different stages in, our, in, in their maturity level, um, each of them asked for something to eat very different from each other. My 11-year-old literally walked right past me and said, I'm hungry. I said, dude, go to the kitchen. You know what you're doing. And he went into the kitchen and, and grabbed, I think, a peanut butter sandwich. And my eight-year-old, uh, she did the same, but she can't reach as high. So she's pulling a chair over and she's jumping on top of things. And my six-year-old, um, if you know my six-year-old Isaiah, he uh, likes to defy all odds, um, especially when it comes into the kitchen. And then, and then my two-year-old can't do it herself. I can't say it, you know, when she came up crying that she wanted milk, I couldn't tell her, just go get your own milk, lady. You know, I'm studying. Dad's busy, you know. Couldn't do it, but yet what, what ended up having to happen was I had to walk with her to the kitchen and I had to help her. She, she's, she's knowing how to open the fridge now and get the milk out herself, um, but I had to wash, wash her cup and, and get it all prepared and then she gave me the milk and I poured it for her and as she walked off saying thank you and I thought about is that how my relationship with God is? That when I know that I'm, I'm struggling with something, that I know that I've had a rough week when I'm going through, through, through things, and it is my relationship with him that I'm just screaming and laying my Christmas list down at his feet so he can answer, or am I really just saying, God, just help me? <laughs> am I really saying, like, I, I just need you to be there every step of the way, and I, and, and I feel like that's really as we started into the week and as I'm telling you I came with so much expectation tonight of like or today tonight uh t- this morning of coming to church and and just knowing that I can be here amongst people of like-minded faith that when I am weak you can be strong and that was the one thing as we would we would we went uh this week and we prayed with Elizabeth and we, we talked with the family and and we're sitting there with the Gonzalez family and one thing I was letting them know like hey we're here to be strong when you don't feel like you can be strong. Let us do that for you. And I feel like as a body of Christ, so many times, that's the first tactic of the enemy that he's going to do is try to say that you're alone, no one understands, and no one's got you. No one sees me. No one knows where I'm at. No one knows what's going on. And that's such a lie from the enemy because we have a church body that even if it's just, uh, we were talking about this last night, Ezzie just sometimes goes through her contacts and just picks a contact and just says, or she goes until she sees a name and she feels it and says, I need to text that person. That happened this week with somebody that she texts him and just said, I just wanted to check in on you, see how things are going. Change the person's world because that day they were praying for, for somebody to reach out that day. Like, that's what each and every one of us can do as we begin to know, like, again, that's the stronghold that the enemy wants to put into our minds or into others' minds that we're alone. And we're not alone. We have each other. And I think more more than we have each other, guess what? We have a loving God that wants to be there for you, that wants to be there for me, even in the middle of trials. Even in the middle of craziness, even in the middle of not knowing which way is up or sideways or where do I go or what do I do? And yet he's standing there saying, hey, I'm I'm here for you. What can I do for you? He's the perfect gentleman. It's amazing to know that Jesus wants to answer your prayer. He wants to answer your question. And he doesn't want to just answer the question. Guess what? He also wants to spend time with you. Did you know that? That he wants to spend time with you. And I think at times we feel like, no, he's this big God up in the sky and he's got this big massive white beard and he's got a hammer like Thor and he's just waiting for me to mess up and he's like, boof, you know, ashes and they're done and he laughs at himself. Like, that's not who God is. That's such a wrong picture. That's how I grew up. I'm just gonna tell you, like, that's what I thought God, who God our Father was. But then I came to realize, like, he doesn't just do that to me. Does he require things of us? Totally, yes. Like, and we're going to get into that as we start to read this morning. We're going to get into some of those things. But what he cares most of is, hey, I want you to know you're my kid. I've told you before, when we, when we get ready to um, perform formal discipline to our children, that what we end up doing is we'll, we'll sit with them and we'll start discussing. This is, do you know why we're, we're at this position that we're at right now? Do you quite understand what's happening? And as we walk through with them, because we just don't want it to be that it's 
I did a mistake and that's it. Like, no, let's walk through it together. And I feel like that's what the Father wants to do this morning is that he wants to walk through it with you. He wants to be there for you to remind you, like, listen, I'm here for you. And so if you have felt alone this week, if you have felt alone this week and that nobody else, and this may be a vulnerable moment, but um, if you felt alone this week, um, I just want you to put your hands out. You don't have to raise your hands. You don't have to do anything. But if you, if you just had that moment, momentary you know, thing question, would you just put your hands out? I just know that the Father wants to fill you up today with his love. And so, Father, we say to those people that had their hands out this week that they are not alone. Man, you're so brave for putting out your hands. Thank you. Like, you, I want you to know that he sees you and he knows you and he loves you that you're not alone. And that even if you just need the reminder this week that, hey, in the middle of my struggle, I'm not alone. And so we just say, Holy Spirit, fill us up this morning. Fill us up to overflow of your love, of your goodness, Jesus. Fill us up to overflow that the person next to me or beside me or around me starts to just feel the, the splash over, just like at SeaWorld, that they just feel that splash of you. Because we want it to be that we walk as children of God We walk in light and not darkness. We walk in wholeness and not half-heartedness. We walk in complete victory and not defeat. And so, Jesus, we are saying every lie that has been spoken over every single one of us this week, we break it off right now in Jesus' name. We stand in full authority that we are called of God. We are loved. We are chosen. We are redeemed by you. So whatever the enemy has been saying to you, to I, to to each of us in this house, we are saying we break that off right now as lies from the pit of hell and we send it right back to where it came from. That we walk in the truth of God. We walk in the truth of God. That we are healed. That we are loved and that we are redeemed this morning. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Yeah. Sorry, I totally have a bunch of notes. Is that okay? Like, are we okay to keep going? So like, I just... (sighs) You know, I'm sure you've you've probably noticed when I come up here to do like mid-service and stuff, I try to, like I'm, I'm leading out in prayer, but like one of the things that's been just on my heart if I could just share real fast before we jump into things. It's like my heart's prayer has been like, God, lead me. Like, lead me. Don't just, like, he, he, he doesn't just push me, but he leads me. And I thought about in Psalms when it says, like, lead me beside still water. Like, you restore my soul. So lead me. And, and, and as one of the pastors, it's been like, lead me as I lead others. Like, show me what it is to be a real leader. Like, with my, with my wife, with my kids. Like, Father, as a husband, like, l- lead me that I can be the husband I need to be, that I can be the father I need to be. Like, lead me. Lead me to where you want me to go. Lead me to what you want me to do. Lead me, like, a, instead of me trying to twist, twist an arm or trying to say, I want to go this way or I want to go that way. But, like, really, Father, just lead me. And it's been this daily prayer of, like, When I walk into the office, it's like, Father, lead me. Lead my conversations. Lead me. Like, Holy Spirit, lead me where you what you want me to do. Lead me to the to the students that need that need that need you more. Lead me to lead when I'm at the store, like lead me to somebody that needs you. Even yesterday we were we were at the store, we were doing an errand and and we could have so easily just been on the task. We were trying to go, we were trying to return shipments that have come to our house and, and we're, 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 we're boxing things up and we're, I mean, we're, we're talking with the person, but we're just trying to get through things. And yet, like we just stopped and started talking away to them and, and even had to remind them that we actually owed them money um, because it was like we, we, we had to print off a label and it cost us a dollar something and we got ready to leave. And Ezzy's like, oh, we actually owe you money. And she's like, oh my gosh, thank you guys. Thank you for being honest. And it was like, of course, like, you know, but I thought about it like, lead me, lead my conversations that when, when we're at some place or we're buying something or we're, or we're talking with people, like lead us so that we just know him more. Because I think it's like as we 
begin, as he begins to lead us and we can lead others, it's like as we begin to show the love of God to others, the more that he wants to show to us. Because otherwise we become stagnant water. Otherwise we become like this, it's, this, it's supposed to be this well, right? It's supposed to be this river of living water that, that flows out of us. But yet, are we holding on to it because we want to just try to keep it to ourselves? Or are we actually trying to pour out so others can know it too? You know, does that make sense? Like I just, like I, I, I want it to be something that we're, we're establishing with our kids that, hey, guess what? Like when you go older, mom and dad might not be here all the time. But the things that I establish in you, I want you to keep moving forward with it. And that's the same thing our heavenly father wants to do to us is he wants to establish new things inside of us today that we can walk it out. That we can walk out this new life that he wants for each and every one of us. Does that make sense a little bit? Okay, so um, if you would, I think we have them up on the screen ready to go. It's Acts chapter 3, coming from the English Standard Version, ESV version. I do really feel like the, word, like the Lord's got a, a specific word for us today. Um, and what he wants to say and, and how he wants to say it. So Jesus just lead us. So Acts chapter three, starting with verse number one, it says, now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a man lame from birth was being carried, um, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the beautiful gate to ask alms or money of those entering the temple. Verse three, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. He asked to receive money. And Peter directed his gaze, his gaze at him, as did John, and said, look at us. He fixed his attention on them, expecting, this is speaking of the man, he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand, I'm telling you, there's, we're going to get into a few of these things here. He took him by the right hand and raised him up. And immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. His feet and his ankles. And, and verse 8, and leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they recognized him as the one who sat at the, temp, at, the, at the beautiful gate of the temple, asking for money. And they were filled with wonder and amazement of what had happened to him. Amen. For the next few moments, I just want to preach to you on this subject, just rise and walk. Everyone, say, everyone turn to your neighbor and say, rise and, walk. rise and walk. Turn to somebody else and say, rise and walk. Rise and walk. You know, in preparing for the message, you start putting everything together and you're reading through verses 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 and you're like, okay, God, what are we, what are we, what, what do you want to say here? What do, what do you want me to type out? What do you want me to do? And um, normally if, if you, in, if you if any of your kids have interned with me, I've, I've given them topics to speak on. They get 10 to 12 minutes. They get a topic. They get three verses and three points. Um, of how they have to put their thought together. So if it's a specific word they have to say, then there's three points to it that they have to add to it, and then there's three verses. And so I, I always tell them, like, that's what you want to do, and, and we're, we're walking through this. I'm, I'm teaching them different things. And then, yeah, um, last night and this morning as I was putting, the, putting everything together, I was, like, trying to put points together. I was trying to make my notes look all beautiful and amazing, and it's not. It doesn't look beautiful and amazing. <laughs> um, I can tell you, there's, like, no points I mean, there is points, but there's not like any bullet points that I'd normally do. So, because I just really feel like it's, it's something like a word that's really to be given to us. It's to rise and walk. This year, as I'm sure most of us have already started to feel, it's like if you've, if you've put anything to it of saying like, hey, this new coming year, I'm going to work out more than I've ever worked out before. If you said, I'm going to eat healthier, I'm going to drink more smoothies, I'm going to walk more, I'm going to speak more life, I'm going to, I mean, there, there's, there's lists and lists and lists, and, and I hope that if you've made some, you've kept to them, because I know that um, statistics say that by the time we get right into the middle of February, here in the next couple of weeks, is where statistics say that it will drop off. 
where you'll be like, listen, working out every morning was cool for a week, but not so much anymore. It may be that that smoothie tasted amazing for the first few days, but now it's, it's a lot to handle. <laughs> As my wife's been putting together smoothies, and this is no way, shape, or form a shot at her. She does amazing of keeping us healthy, um, me and my family. And, but um, she always, like, she puts everything out and says, this is what you need to put in the smoothie. And it's like, I just tell her, just lay it all out for me so I can just go step one, step two, step three, this seed, that seed, this leaf, that leaf, this thing, that thing. I can just be able to put it all together. And so, um, you know, but as we're walking through, it's like, but yet, here's this lame man that had been from birth. And they brought him to the temple every single day. They were asking him, I'm sure the people that were bringing him were telling him that he's the one to bring money in. I don't know if he was the main money maker of that time. I don't know how much money. The Bible never describes a question that I may have when we get to heaven. I just want to know, like, who are the people that brought him every single day and laid him at this gate? Um, and so, but you see where we break into the story where it's Peter and John and, and already Acts 2 has already happened. So the infilling of the Holy Spirit and they were, had tongues of fire and power was falling on them. But I, I, in my mind, as we started off this, this lesson, it's like, were they just going about their business just to go to the temple to, to perform their duty and check it off the mark and then go home? I don't know. But I can tell you that sometimes you and I, and I say I, myself included, that we can feel like sometimes we're just trying to go through the motions to check off the mark. That makes sense? Sometimes we're just trying to get through the Bible reading because we're just like, I I said I was going to read it in the year. Lord, I'm not going to be a liar. And so you're trying to read through as much as possible as you're going through. And so, and see, so John, Peter and John are walking into the temple, maybe just going about their thing. And yet here comes this encounter with this man. He's there to collect money from people going into the temple, maybe to give of their own offering, maybe to give of their own self. And, and, and yet what he's trying to do is, is say, hey, what you were going to give to God, I want you to try to give to me. I don't know if that was the question. It maybe that's, maybe, I'm, getting, I'm, I'm applying a, a few things here, okay? I'm, I'm using the imagination. Please walk through with it with me. And so, but, it, but as he started to go through, it says where he looked and he saw him. And so I, in my mind, did he ever question that how come I'm outside the temple gate, but how come I can never be inside the temple? But it was a question that he began to think of, of, of am I out here? You see, because gates were represented as transitions or protections uh, in those times. Of people would, would talk about the gates of the city. It would be a protection for that city or it would be a transition time that they would be going through. And I know that as we've moved into 2023 and we've left behind 2022 of all those things, and yes, we're coming into 23, like what portion of transition are we all feeling to be a part of at this moment? Where where God has has brought us out of one year and is positioning us now for success into the next year, but if we might be in the middle of, of, of transition time, or where are we actually falling to fill at this moment? Are we feeling like we're here, but we're not quite there yet? Are we struggling because we're trying to get to this place, this gate called beautiful, this, that we're trying to get to this position so that we can be able to see the glory of God move? But maybe you're in transition right now. Maybe you're in the middle of the struggle right now. Maybe you're in the middle of the trial, of the, of the hurt, of the pain. I don't know, but I can tell you this. that it's mo- When we look at it, we know that rather we're here or we're over there, that still knowing that God is good to us. You know, it, it, was, it was amazing. I just got to brag on Taylor. She's here tonight. Our, man, I keep saying tonight. I'm so sorry. I guess I'm used to preaching to the young people on Wednesday night. I'm, I'm so proud of Taylor. I got to tell you, we, we're in the hospital room with her, and... Um, Every, every, every people are praying and we're, we're standing there and and all of a sudden you start hearing this small voice start to worship and sing a song and you're sitting there and i'm like dude like my eyes get open i'm like please tell me that's taylor and i look over and sure enough and it's taylor holding her mom's hand as she's singing i can't believe how good the lord is Amen. talk about just blah as i started to just sit back there and cry because it's like Man, Taylor was hold, is, is still holding on strong and to her faith. And so, you know, knowing, and, and then we're Friday night as we ended our prayer time and, and uh, she gets a phone call to be up into the, into the room. I'm following with her and I'm, I'm talking with her and we get into the elevator and she turns and looks at it and says, no matter what, the Lord is good. 
Yeah. And I thought, man, do I have that heart posture? That Taylor who's 20 years old and, 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 and praying for her mom's life, and she gets into the elevator and says, no matter what, the Lord is good. And she just starts telling all of us in the elevator, no matter what. Remember, Taylor? Do you kind of remember that? Okay, yeah. And so she's like going through it, and we're talking, and it's like, dude, the heart posture that she begins to have that no matter what, the Lord is good. And it's like, do you and I have that heart posture in the middle of this transition time? In the middle of the struggle, do I have a heart posture that says, no matter what, the Lord is good? I thought about Psalms chapter 118, verse 19 through 20 out of the New Living Translation. It says, open for me the gates where the righteous enter, and I will go in and thank the Lord. The, these gates lead to the presence of the Lord, and the godly enter, enter there. Open the gates where the righteous enter, and I will go in and what? Thank the Lord. Because in the middle of struggle, you know what? God's not sitting there trying to say like, I'm just going to put them in the middle of struggle so they can figure it out. No, 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 no. What he's doing is he's checking our heart to say, hey, what is our heart going to say? Because Job's wife turned to him and said, just curse God and die. His friends are like, what's wrong with you, Job? And what does Job respond with? No matter what, God is still good. Whether he keeps me here or who moves me on, what matters most is my heart says, I'm still going to thank the Lord. It says that the gates lead us to the presence of the Lord and the godly enter there. The gate, the transition time leads us into the presence of God. Because in the presence of God is where I find my strength. In the presence of God is where I find my hope. In the presence of God is, guess what? Where I find the answer I've been looking for. It's not necessarily, and I've been thinking about this lately. Like It's, like it's not necessarily it's just the answer, but it's the who to the answer. Because I'm not just looking for a yes, a no, a wait. I'm trying to figure all these things. No, I'm saying, God, I'm trying to search more of your face that I can see you more. I'm trying to search out the hope of glory that I know that you bring, that all I've got to do. Uh, I think Fallon said it last week when, when she's talked about, you know, being in the presence of God for one song and it turned into like five. It's like, that's what he wants. He wants us to get lost in his presence that everything else melts away. Because it's our heart posture that says no matter what, God is still good. It's our transition positioning time that says, no matter the struggle, no matter the trial, God still got it because he wants us to rise and walk. You see, he's asking for money and, and, and the man's asking for money and he looks over and it says that he looked at them as they were getting ready to walk into the temple. And he looked right at them and then as they began to walk towards him, it says that he put his eyes down. Or they basically told him, look up at me. So he sees them. Okay, picture this. He sees them. They start walking towards him, and he automatically puts his head down. Enough that the Bible says that Peter said he had to, he had to tell the guy, look up at me. Why was he looking down? Why would for a moment he's looking up to see the people walking towards him, but when they get close enough that he all of a sudden put his head down? When thinking about this, it's like, did he maybe feel unworthy that, or maybe the way people felt towards him, or did he feel embarrassed or ashamed, or maybe it was that he was thinking to himself, like, am I so unclean that people don't even look at me? When they begin to come towards me, I'm just putting out the cup to try to ask for, for, for money, and, and I'm sure all these questions were going through, through his mind, but it says where, where Peter says, hey, you've got to look up at me. And that's what I feel like a lot of times what ends up happening. It's like, you know, um, sometimes when it's like you feel like you made a mistake and you go to say sorry to the person, it's kind of hard to like look them in the eye. You're like, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. You know, you, you start looking around, you start kind of kicking the dirt a little bit. You start kind of twiddling with your thumbs. You're looking everywhere else, but actually into the eyes of the one that really matters. And I feel like that's where like our heart posture can be. It's like, did, was he upset or did he feel so ashamed that when they walked towards him that he started to look down? And yet here's this beautiful picture of where Peter begins to tell him to look up at us. Or to, yeah, he tells the man, like, I want you to look up at me. 
You see, Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, it says, If you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things of this earth. What the Bible's trying to describe to us is says it's your mindset that you've got to look at. It's that we're seated, we're seating with ourselves. It's verses one through verses one and two, Colossians three, one and two. Um, if you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. And then it tells us, set your minds on things that are above. Set your mind on things that's above. Because we automatically start to think worst case scenario in our head. Am I the only one that's ever done that? We start thinking worst case scenario. We made a mistake and we're like, okay, now we got to hide and we got to figure this out. My son yesterday, as we were, he was getting into things in the kitchen that he knew he was not supposed to get into. And when I walked into the kitchen, all of a sudden I see, I look over, we catch eyes and he goes, nothing, dad, nothing. (laughs) Dude. (laughs) <laughs> hand it over, you know, I, I won't tell you what exactly he got into, but he was like, you know, and, and it's the same thing when, as we've been trying to eat healthier, it's like candy gets into the house in some way, shape or form. I won't say exactly which parent of us bring it into the room house, but, um, I'll just leave that up to interpretation. And so, but, I, but I try to hide, well, okay, that just gave it away. Um, but I try, I try to put it in the top shelf of the pantry. So that way I know that they can't get to it. But it's like the next morning, my kids haven't learned that to throw away the trash properly so that they know that we didn't get in, they, that we know that they didn't get into it, you know? And so it's funny to go into the room and they've got all these wrappers and they start pointing at each other of who exactly ate the candy. But see, the mindset is, it's not on things above, it's trying to get that, that quick satisfaction of the, of the candy that they want to get to, myself included, I'm, it's not just them. But here's the thing, though. It's like when we have seen what Christ can do, and the Bible tells us that we are raised with Christ, but it's now telling us that not only that, we're to remember where Christ is seated and where we're seated with him at. But not only are we supposed to remind ourselves where we're seated at, it's like our mindset has to change that we constantly have these things in our mind. That's why the Bible describes it and says, what so would think on these things, whatever is true, whatever is holy, whatever is righteous. It starts breaking all these things of good report because it says that there's so many things that the enemy wants to throw at you to get you to be rethinking about or distracted about all the wrong scenarios or all the wrong things or all the what ifs. And yet what God is trying to say is, if you just listen for a moment, I'm trying to give you truth that you are who you who I say you are with our kids we constantly go through that like hey listen you're you're my son nobody and nothing takes that away it's the same concept if I'm saying it to my own kids I believe that the father is saying to us today hey I want you to be reminded you're my son and my daughter I want you to know you're seated with me in heavenly places See, we forget that because we think he's seated there and I'm down here. No, 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 no. It's just as much as when we sit with Eliana and we put her on our lap because we want her to sit with us. She sits in that place of authority with us. That's when she starts barking orders to all the other kids around her because she knows whose lap she's sitting in. Does that make sense? And so that's the same thing you and I have to remember. Whose lap are we sitting in? Who are we paying attention to? Who's the one actually speaking to us in? Who am I connecting with that when he says rise and walk, I get up and I walk? The Bible says that when he looked at them, he looked with expectation as to receive something. I believe that's what our prayer time has to look like, that we come into our prayer closet with expectation because we know that he's good and he's going to do it again. We cannot come and be in this walk with God and be half-hearted where we somewhat are on the fence that maybe he will, but maybe he won't. We can't be on this fence that we're still thinking of, of the lie or, or thinking of the things that the enemy's trying to put into our, into our hearts and our minds that, no, we, we don't have the best of marriage or you don't come from the right background or you don't have the right things. Just as much as that lame man was sitting there saying, I can't go into the temple because no one will actually carry me in there or because I'm not fit enough. I don't have enough uh, put together. Uh, it says lame, but literally it was just his feet and his ankles. And so like was it in his mind is thinking about that I'm so unworthy that I can't 
get there. And yet what the Bible's trying to teach us is the expectation of that when I come into the presence of God, something is going to happen. Man, I'm telling you, we had to do it the other day at our house. We had to call our kids together and say, hey, there is something going on in, 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 in all of us. We're going to put on some worship music and we're going to break things off. I'm telling you, you got to get some umph inside of you that in your walk with God that says, no, 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 no. Like, I do have an amazing marriage. I, I am a good husband. I am, I'm saying for me, right? I am a good father. Like there's those declarations that we begin to have to walk out because what the enemy wants you to do is start believing the lie that you can't or you won't or you're not good enough. He wants you to think that you're lame and guess what? You're not lame. You're not broken and discouraged. What you are is a child of God who knows who their daddy is that when we call on his name, he's faithful and just to forgive. He's going to forgive and he's going to lift us up and say, let's walk again. It, man, when my, when my kids were learning to walk, it wasn't like this whole, you know, they, they trip and fall and it's like, well, you know, I think Wendy Backlund said that like that. Like, you know, well, they're just not called to be walkers. They're going to crawl for the rest of their life. That's not it, right? Like we do it with our kids, man. You know, so many things we can learn from, from children. It's kind of funny to watch. Um, it's just as much as like the, 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 the meme says, like it doesn't matter how big or how bad or how you know, tough you may think you are. When a little kid walks up to you with a play phone and says it's for you, you answer it, <laughs> right? It doesn't matter what you're going through. You're gonna grab the phone. You're gonna be like, yeah, let's talk, you know? And then you have the same conversation. Oh, really? Uh-huh, all right. Oh, you want so-and-so? Okay, it's actually for you. <laughs> Okay, let's think for a moment. Let, let, let's stop, like, you know, sorry. I, you know, let's, let's think about this for a moment. I don't just say, like, they're no longer walkers, but, man, we, we, we celebrate the learning opportunity that they just went through to be able now to take the next step. Yeah. See, our mindset, as Colossians said, we have to set our minds and change up our minds that we now think about that we're seated with Christ in heavenly places. So when we go to make decisions... When we go to pray, when we go to talk to people, we're making it from this position versus just down here trying to survive. But what he's really wanting you to do is to know that he's already given you the tools to thrive because he's already called you beloved. He's already sat you with him. And it doesn't have to be that, you, it, that, that it, it, he already sat you. He's already had you sit with him that you don't have to worry about what's going on around you. You know, there's safety and comfort. I believe that all of us have, have, hopefully we've all felt that before. And if not, I promise you, you will, especially here at our church that likes to hug a lot. There's, there's safety and comfort in the hug because it's the close proximityness to somebody else. Uh, me and Pastor Lynn always laugh because I'm not much of a hugger. I've said that before. I, I'm working on it. We're working on it. It's good. I actually, I, I hugged uh, Selena when she was over here. She said, I want to hug you, but... I know that you know I'm okay. We'll hug, you know. Um, but I thought about that with Pastor Lynn. That was the one thing that we started talking about was the way that in which we hug because we want people to know that you are loved. You know, if you've ever gotten a hug from Pam, I, don't, I think she's back there getting ready for Social Sunday. I'm telling you. Like, it's a Pam hug. There's a difference of just like a pat on the back versus a Pam hug. Pam will literally, like, I sometimes feel like she's going to squeeze me and then try to pick me up, <laughs> you know? <laughs> she might, I don't know. Um, but, like, the expectation that we have to have to know that he loves us, the expectation that we have to have to know that he cares and he's listening. Philippians chapter 1, verse 20, it says, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, no, uh, now, as always, Christ will be honored in my body, rather by life or death. It's my eager expectation and hope that I will not, well, I will not be at all ashamed, but I will have full courage now, as always, Christ being honored in my body. It's the position that we have to set ourselves up for expectation. The expectation to understand defined as the process of becoming greater in size, number, or amount. 
It cannot be the expectation that when they came walking to this man, it can't be the expectation that all it's going to be is the same old, same old, and I'm going to walk away the same. No. I'm sure his expectation was that not only because they have called to, for him to look straight at him, but also to the expectation for them to, for him to understand that something is about to happen. The expectation of something's about to increase. Maybe for a quick second, he thought, I'm about to get the most money I've ever received in my whole entire life. Maybe for a quick split second, he thought these guys are filthy rich and they're going to drop everything at me and I'm not going to have to do this again. Maybe for a quick second, he thought now's the day that this is all goes away. All my financial problems are just going just gonna to melt away. But yet what Peter says is, I don't have silver or gold. What a letdown. I'm sure his heart just dropped for a quick moment and was like, are you kidding me? And Peter then begins to explain, I don't have silver and gold, but what I do have, I'm going to give to you. What an awesome picture of what Jesus does to each and every one of us. Don't get me wrong. I believe that he wants to bless us financially more than we could ever think, hope, or imagine. Don't you believe that, right? But also, too, because the finances that he wants to bless us with is not just for us to be able to survive, but it's for us to thrive in his presence. And the expectation when Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but what I do have, I'm going to give to you. You see, because silver and, and gold were wealth of that time, silver is, is known for the reflection of how others see us. He says, when you're looking at me, you're not seeing what others see you as. Okay, let's break that down for a minute because maybe, maybe we're a little lost. Maybe I wrote it down too late at night. Silver is to be the reflection was going to be, when it's, when it's laid out, it reflects for you to see who you are. So when Peter said, silver and gold, I don't have, what he was destroying is the lie that others see you as lame or how you see yourself is lame. But I don't see you as that. Did you catch, does that make sense now? Okay, that's what he's saying. When he says, silver and gold have I none, what he's saying is when you look at me, you don't see yourself as, as you are. I'm going to show you how to see yourself as he really sees you. Okay. So he says silver and gold. So he's establishing now, not how others see you, gold. He's saying the knowledge or even the highest mineral, mineral to be established at that time. He's saying, I don't even have the thing that you feel like is going to take care of all your problems. Because again, he's just trying to get money to survive. He's just trying to get through the day. He's just trying to get through the motion. And what Peter's saying is, I'm not just going to give you something that's going to help you today, but I'm going to give you something that's going to help your soul for all eternity. So when he says, I don't have anything, I don't have all that, maybe it was a huge letdown. But when Peter says, but what I do have, I think sets up the whole entire expectation. What I do have. Peter, as we've known, has always been an outspoken, most risk-taking of the disciples. But he says, what I do have. What was Peter talking about? He's talking about his Acts 2 experience, that what I do have is a relationship with a loving God that not only wants to be around me at all times, but wants to be living inside of me at all times. What I do have is not just carrying yesterday's, uh, yesterday's failures, but what I do carry is a God who sees me tomorrow's success. What I do carry is a joy that isn't just in the middle of struggle, but the joy that's going to that's gonna overflow, that's going to keep me going from day in and day out, that in the middle of circumstance, God is still good. Peter says, what I'm going to give you is going to give you basically life and life more abundant. You see, it's a beautiful picture of what we see of what Jesus does to each and every one of us, because we can account ourselves as the lame man from time to time. But yet what Jesus is doing through Peter, what, what the Holy Spirit's doing through Peter is a picture for us to be able to see that what God wants to do inside of each and every one of us today is he does not want you to see who you think you are and, and, and what, you're, what you're believing or what you're allowing others to say. What he wants to do is to say, I don't have those things because I don't talk that way. I don't believe that way. What I do believe is the God that lives inside of you is going to cause you to rise up to life today. And so... Um, uh, uh, let me jump into this next verse. 
Uh, Psalms 126, verse 4. It's coming from the New Passion Translation. 126, verse 4. It's coming again from, excuse me, the Passion Translation. It says, now, Lord, do it again. Restore us to our former glory. May streams of your refreshing flow over us until our dry hearts are drenched again. I'm telling you if, you, if you mark it in your Bible, write it down. Psalms 124, verse 6, out of the Passion. Now, Lord, do it again. Restore us to our former glory. You see, it's like, man, restore us because what, what the enemy has taken from us, we may feel like maybe lost forever. But what the Lord wants to do today is restore the hearts of us to be able to connect with our Father who's in heaven. It says, may, our stream, may your streams of refreshing flow over us until our dry hearts are drenched again. Man, I just don't want to be splashed or I want to be sprayed on with a mister. I want to be drenched in the love of God. I want to be drenched so much that it's like one of those things where like you can't help, people can't help but look at and be like, man, what happened to you? Let me tell you what happened to me. It's the love of God that happened to me. It's the glory of God that happened to me. In the middle of your struggle, can I tell you, our prayer should be that God drench us with your love that we can feel you greater than we've ever felt you before. Drench us again, dear Jesus. Everyone say, drench me, God. Turn to your neighbor and say, I hope you get drenched. <laughs> Man, I should have brought like a, like a super soaker and just started spraying everybody. Gah! Next time. Okay, next time. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Or am I? Mm. Um, it sounds like a fun thing to do in youth group. We'll do it there. Um, so here's the next thing. And, and, and I've only got a few more, few more points, and then we're going we're gonna to end here. And that the Bible says that when Peter says, silver and gold have I none, but what I do have I'm going to give to you. The Bible then goes to describe that he took him by his right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. The Bible describes that the right hand is, in sense, a place of honor and, and status throughout the Bible context, biblical context. It's giving the power and the authority. So what Peter was doing was reestablishing the authority that he has to be able to call out those things as, as if they were not, that they are. What he's reaching out is saying, listen, I'm going to reestablish what God has called you, and that is a walker, not a person that's just going to sit there forever. What Peter was doing was saying, I'm going to give you uh, the right hand to a position, a place of honor, and to be able to pull you up. You see, because then I, I, was, look, I was thinking about it again. It, it says he's a lame man, which means like he couldn't walk. And it kind of got me thinking. But yet then when the Bible described it as feet and ankles were immediately made well and he began to walk, I thought, what really does ankles mean? So I started to do a little bit of study into what does biblical ankles mean. And of course, all these different things started pulling up and started going through and reading different things. And what I came to find out was that when it was representing ankles, a spiritual meaning behind ankles could also be faith. What Peter was reestablishing was his faith inside of him. And then feet. We see feet all the time throughout the Bible. What is that representing? And it's, it, it went into different things. And one of the things that it, it, it made me start, really, it made me start laughing in the middle of the night because it says that it's having a new you and your feet made whole to spread the gospel. So when he was made whole, his faith was restored, excuse me, his identity was restored to know who he is, his faith was restored to know what he can do, and then his feet were restored so that he can walk out what God has called him to do. His feet were restored. And then the Bible says that he began jumping, praising God. And even the people were amazed. And what makes, makes it more interesting is they actually recognized him, not for who he was at that moment, but for who he used to be. They said, wasn't this the guy that constantly was at the, the gate? You know, it's interesting as you, you read different miracles of what Jesus did, nine times out of 10, the naysayers, the Pharisees, the people that were trying to question Jesus or question God always didn't attack what was going on right there. But they said, man, 
like you were the one that was over here. Like when Jesus heals the paralyzed man at the pool, they got more mad that the man was healed and carrying his own mat on a day he wasn't supposed to than being in amazement and awe that he's healed. And here comes naysayers again to be like, wait, wasn't this the man? And pointing back, wasn't this the person that always asked for this or that? Trying to get the man, I'm sure, to question in his mind, man, is this really real? Or am I living some type of dream? Can I tell you that's what the enemy wants to do to each and every one of us? Is he wants to try to get you to think back here. But didn't we read in Colossians that we have to have a new mind that we're seated with him in heavenly places? That I don't think about the mistakes and failures. Do I have to ask for forgiveness for those with God? Yes. Is he faithful and just to forgive us? Yes. But guess what? He washes all that away. So that you and I can receive that healing touch that our ankle, our faith can be renewed this morning so that we can go out and spread the gospel, the good news. But the most of all, so that we can be reestablished that I am who he says I am. That I don't look into silver and that's the reflection that I see. No, that I actually look into the eyes of Jesus and that's the reflection that I see. So our, 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 our command, our charge for this morning is to, is to walk, to rise and walk in new life, to rise and walk in who he's called us to be. Are we gonna make mistakes? Can I tell you? Yes, we might, we may, we probably will. But here's the beautiful thing, and I didn't, I didn't give these verses and that's okay, Karen, we don't have to look at them, but later on into, into chapter three, it makes, in the ESV version, it makes an interesting statement that it says, the man clung to Peter and John. Now, maybe he was trying to figure out how to walk, but he knew who to grab onto, the people that were speaking life into him. Can I tell you that in the middle of our struggles too, who are we clinging on to? That are they speaking life into us? Are they teaching us to walk? Our circle becomes very interesting, especially in difficult times of we see where we're at and what's going on and then people come alongside. And again, let us be your strength. We see that all throughout the Bible where Moses, his hands are getting tired as keeping his hands up so the Israelites can win the battle. That we see where, where Aaron and, and I think, think, I believe it was Joshua, they come alongside and start holding up his hands. You know, it's interesting. Um, yesterday, I, I went in for a haircut and, and I was sitting down talking to the lady and some of the first questions I always get is like, what do you do for a living? Um, and so we started talking and um, she was asking me how my weekend went or how my week was. And I was like, it, it was good. I said, but you know, we have a family friend that we're praying for that's in the hospital right now. And, and she's like, no way. And so we started discussing things and and uh, she asked for her name and I told her her name and she goes, what? And she like stopped cutting my hair and I, I told her her name and she goes, you're the second person in here today that has mentioned her. And I was like, really? And she said, yeah. She goes, can I tell you something? Is that gonna be okay about God? And I was like, yeah. I hadn't told her what I did for a living yet. And I said, yeah, totally, please tell me. And she said, do you believe that God speaks to us? And I was like, totally she's like do you believe she's like that maybe God is telling me that I need to be praying for her and I was like that's awesome you know I was trying to like not start jumping up and down for joy or you know whatever I'm still sitting in the chair and but can I tell you that when when we need it most who are we clinging to are we clinging to the one that gives us life and life more abundant are we holding on to that lie that we're still lame and we can't, we won't, we will never be able to? Are we, this, are we this morning going to take the stand and say, listen, I've been commanded to rise and walk. I know that if he says I can rise and walk, it means that everything that is holding me back has to fall off. Because when I hear the word and I obey the word, that's when miracles begin to happen. 
I believe we're probably going to see, not probably, let's rephrase that. I believe we are going to see the greatest miracles, creative miracles. We were talking about that earlier. We're going to see the creative miracles. We're going to see the greatest revival amongst our, our, our valley and, and amongst our people that we've ever seen this coming year. I feel it so strong that it's like um, we've been hearing reports of like how Caldwell will become ground zero of how things are actually supposed to be and how things are actually supposed to be done for all of Valley and maybe even all the state and all the nation. And so it's like, man, I have been thinking about that and every decision that I go to make, I wanna make it because I know that it's affecting and it's not just gonna affect my life, it's gonna affect my children's life. And it's not just gonna affect my children's life, but it's gonna affect my children's children's life. And it's not just gonna affect their life, but it's gonna affect the thousands that they're gonna stand in front of and preach the gospel to. It's like right here at Valley Church, every single one of you have walked in this morning, God is not saying you're lame. He's saying you are righteous, holy, and redeemed. And what he is calling us this morning is to rise and walk because we've got a gospel to preach. We've got a world that needs saving. We've got, we've got people at our jobs that need Jesus more. We've got our families that need Jesus more. We've got, we've got our children that need to know who they really are in God and not some other report or some people telling them, this is who you're supposed to be. No, 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 no. God already says who you're supposed to be. And that's the word that I'm believing this morning. So would you stand with me to your feet? Oh, cool. If our prayer team will make their way on up here. Does, did this make sense? I hope I, I gave, I hope I articulated enough to be able to, to let you know what I'm feeling and what the Lord's, the Lord's saying this morning. But a couple things before we go here. One, you're not alone. I want you to know that right here, right now. You're not alone. You've got a pastoral staff that loves you. You've got a church family that, that loves you. And we've got people up here that want to pray for you. And two, that every, every trial, stress that you face this week is not the end. It's not the end. You know what it means? It means that the glory of God is about to show so much stronger in your life right here, right now. It means that even though I may be going through hard times, the Lord is still good. And his love towards me is amazing. So would you put your hands out? We're going to end in prayer. And then at the end here, you'll be invited up. If you'd like to pray or you'd like to even just come up and pray by yourself, you totally can. So Father, I thank you for the command and the picture that you showed us through, through your own disciples of Peter and John to rise and walk. I'm, I thank you for the command this morning is to rise and walk. That when we stand, we stand with you. We stand in fullness and completeness in you because our mindset is no longer on the things of this earth, but on, on you. It's no longer on, 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 on all these things and on all the distractions that the enemy is trying to put into our lives. We're saying distractions, you got to go right now in Jesus' name. That every single one of us have been called to a purpose. Every single one of us is called to a plan of you, Jesus. And so we just say that this week, we're going to walk it out. We're going to walk out your goodness stronger than we've ever walked it out before. We're going to walk out your joy than we've, uh, stronger than we've ever walked out before. We're going to walk out your love stronger than we've ever walked out before. We're going to go into our works, into our schools, into our homes with a brand new smile on our face because we know that our trust is in you. We know that our hope is in you. We know that when we lay everything down at your feet, you give us a new robe. You give us a new ring. You call us even by a new name, God. That we're not our failures from yesterday, but we're your sons and daughters today. So we just say, be with us this week. Be with us, be with us this week. Jesus. I just really feel that you keep your hands out for just one more moment. I just really feel like a challenge, if that's okay. Like it's almost like the Lord's calling us to this new level, but we have to be the ones to take the authority back in our house. Because maybe there's something that we've allowed to creep in. It's the small foxes that will spoil the vine. And maybe we've allowed something to come into our house this week that, that shouldn't be there. And so this week, mom and dad, I would say, call it out. Be like, hey, that's not who we're called to be and that's not what we're called to do. 
When you walk into your house today, let us to every step that we take into our house, let it be in the authority in the name of Jesus. That we bring peace into our house. We bring comfort into our house. We bring a God that's bigger and better than anything else that's out there. Because silver and gold, we ain't got none. But what we do have is the hope and trust in you. What we do have is a God that lives inside of me. What I do, what I do have, what I can bring is this God of hope and glory. That wherever we go in our car, that you'd be there. Uh, the glory would just ooze out of our car, God. Like we, we'd even say even at our schools that your glory would be taken into our schools and your glory be taken into our workplaces and your glory be taken at Walmart and Target. We just say, glory fall. Wherever we go, let your glory fall. That we just be like that lame man, that we walk and we jump and we praise and we worship because of the joy of the Lord that's living inside of us. So we thank you for it in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Be with us this week as we go. And as we come again next week, let us just rise and walk this week. Let us rise and walk in your goodness and your glory. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.